Um, so today uh, we'll be talking on uh, a few kind of applications around uh, visual data summarization focused mainly towards videos. So uh, clearly there's a data explosion with visual data, right? So we have uh, uh, kind of videos dominating the, the data being generated today. And a, a lot of this data is actually generated from, uh, it's kind of machine generated. So it's automatically generated through IP cameras or through uh, dash cams or drone footage, et cetera. So we have, we have a lot of this data getting generated. And uh, this kind of has several challenges, right? So. <clears throat> How do you effectively consume these kind of long videos? And the same also extends to digital photo collections being generated today, uh, where you have several thousands of photos from, from a holiday trip. So the, uh, for us humans, we want to be able to have effective means to consume these long videos. And uh, we also often want to be able to find events of interest quickly. So, uh, this is this is very relevant for the footage generated from these machine generated machine sources like uh, like IP cameras or uh, or drones, where you want to find certain events and you often are faced with the challenge of being able to uh, have to go over uh, you know hundreds of hours of video footage. So <clears throat> a few applications of video summarization. Obviously, you have surveillance cameras. You have uh, body cams uh, uh, where, again, you want to kind of, you, you have a lot of footage generated and you want to be able to, you know, for the, for the purposes of evidence, be able to find incidences. Or you also have online or personal videos where often you, you have these events which you kind of film. You are faced with a challenge of, you know, having a long video where maybe you want to automatically find highlights. So each of these problems have slightly different flavors of, uh, kind of video summarization in them. In the case of surveillance, we are really interested in the different events that are there and kind of getting a quick visual summary of uh, the, the, the set of events. Whereas in the case of uh, the online videos, we are probably very interested in kind of highlights or you know kind of important visual events that you want to capture and generate in a summary. So, <clears throat> Towards this, we'll be mainly looking at a few applications around uh, video summarization in this talk. And uh, essentially, the idea is you have long videos. We, have, we often have different uh, kind of uh, intuitions of what it means by, by having a visual summary. It's, it's, it's somewhat of an uh, ambiguous problem if you just state it to be a video summarization problem, unless you know what is the domain which, where you're kind of wanting to use this video summarization. So towards this, we'll try to build some intuition towards a, a, a family of summarization models that can be used for these problems. And I'm hoping that you know, in, in this talk, I can kind of convey a few intuitions towards the, the, the modeling choice of some of these uh, kind of models. And towards the end of the talk, we will actually cover um, a kind of learning framework that can, in a unified manner, uh, learn uh, these for different, different problems. So basically, the outline, I will uh, introduce a family of models, which are, uh, which are defined through these notions of submodular functions. I'll go over these in, in detail. And then we'll actually go over uh, the, the algorithms used to, to solve these, and also several implementation tricks that can be done to actually kind of build, uh, build systems in practice. And then I'll go over the modeling intuition of these for video summarization uh, particularly and kind of give some intuition of how different models have different interpretations and they, had, they, they generate different kind of summaries. And finally, we'll be going over a learning framework for uh, domain-specific video summarization. So we'll highlight how as I kind of uh, uh, kind of spoke in the beginning, that you have different uh, domains where, in, in some sense, of what constitutes a summary is is different. So we really want to have a unified learning framework that can be able to learn the right uh, models for these domains. And we'll also highlight uh, kind of uh, from the learned mixtures uh, of the submodular functions. We'll try to highlight how 
the results are actually quite intuitive what you would actually design when you if you were to build a, a model for each of these domains. <clears throat> So I'd like to point out that this is based on joint work with several colleagues, including my advisor, uh, my, my PhD advisor, Jeff Bilms, and uh, collaborators, Kai Sebastian, and also some collaborators from IIT Bombay, Vishal Kaushal and Ganesh Ramakrishnan. So, uh, so basically, combinatorial problems kind of abound uh, in, um, in machine learning, right? So you have several problems, including data subset selection, uh, summarization, uh, image segmentation, all of these problems basically uh, kind of can be seen as a combinatorial optimization problem where you want to f select a subset of either pixels or images or data points for training uh, uh, amongst a kind of bigger set of possible options, right? So the the set selection problems can be kind of unified by, by defining the, uh, these discrete optimization functions, which basically operate on subsets. So just the way you have continuous optimization uh, loss functions which operate on uh, vectors in R raised to n, here we can define uh, functions which operate on subsets, and we define V over here as a ground set of all possible options which you want to choose from. And the idea is you want to choose a subset of this, and for this given subset, you, you have a valuation for this, right? So in general, set function optimization is very hard. So uh, basically, as you can see, if, if we have some special structure for this, uh, we can obviously do optimization in, uh, in, in the problems become much easier. So one specific structure which we shall look at, which also actually uh, occurs a lot for several natural problems, right? And this is the, the, the concept of submodular functions. So the idea is that the, 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 uh, we, we define a function as a submodular function if um, the, the gain of adding an element uh, shrinks as the context of the set grows. So basically I have two sets here, A and B. Adding an element V to A uh, will have a larger gain than adding the element uh, V to B if A is a subset of B. So one, uh, one natural intuition of this is define a function F here, so you have a set of balls, right? So in the left-hand side, you have a set of five balls. In the right-hand side, you have a set of uh, seven balls. So here, each kind of ball is an element of my uh, uh, subset. And uh, here the left-hand side case is a subset of the set of elements on the right-hand side case. I add uh, an element uh, here, and if you compute the gain, the, the, and you define f as the number of distinct colors of the balls in this one, right? So in the left-hand side case, the, the, the f of this set is two. In the right-hand side case, f of the set is three. And, and you can see if you add the blue ball here, the gain is one. Whereas in the right-hand side case, the gain is zero. So you see here there is a diminishing returns. So this function is submodular. And actually, it's, it's not hard to see that this is actually known as a famous set. This can be seen as a set cover uh, function, which I will, will be actually looking at this through the talk. So again, some intuitions of why uh, these functions are the right models for summarization. So Again, imagine I have an image collection, and my task is to get a subset of images which form a summary, a visual summary. Then uh, you add a new element, and imagine you have a F here, which basically is the amount of information um, that my, my uh, subset contains, that the information could be all the visual words or you know, some notion of information. And uh, essentially, we see here that if, if, if I add a, a, di a different element uh, to a subset, uh, the, the gain in information would be, would be more than adding it to a superset, because it is likely that the superset already contains that information uh, because it's a larger set. So in some sense, we can see that, again, we see this information gain uh, reducing. So it's kind of somewhat natural that these models would be, would be fitting models for these problems. Of course, the question is how do we define these models uh, for some of these problems, and that is what we will cover in uh, this, this, at least partly try to answer in this talk. 
So <clears throat> a few instantiations that we shall consider in this talk. So we look at a family of functions. The, the first ones we will define as uh, representation functions. Uh, then we look, look at a family of functions which we shall call diversity functions. And then uh, the third family uh, will be what we shall call coverage functions. And finally, we'll uh, define the notion of importance functions which shall be scores uh, for, for, every, for every element. And these we shall see uh, will, be called, will be modular functions which is essentially is kind of a linear analog of in the discrete space. So, Essentially, the, the, the value of, of a set is just an additive sum of the elements in the set. Um, so we shall look at a family of all of these functions and then try to argue about the modeling um, capability of these functions. So starting with representation functions, we, we have three specific kinds of representation functions. Of course, there are more, but I've just highlighted three here. So uh, we, we'll focus mainly on the, the, what we shall call the facility location uh, function. And the idea of facility location is, it, if, if you see this objective, it is very similar to uh, a k-means or actually a k-medioids kind of objective, where we want to, uh, we, we often when we want to maximize the facility location function, we want to get a set of points that kind of intuitively are the centroids of uh, the clusters. So uh, these functions would basically tend to pick out the representative uh, set of images from my entire set and, and it would ignore uh, the outliers. Uh, we also have the diversity functions. The diversity functions, uh, as opposed to the representation function, if you see one kind of characteristic of the representation function, they are all, they also have this sum of the elements in the ground set, right? So in some sense, they are trying to find representatives for every element in my ground set. It, they, they want to find a set X so that it can be representative for every element in the ground set. Uh, the diversity functions don't really care about the ground set. They just care about the set of elements that have been uh, chosen. And they want the set of elements that have been chosen to be as diverse uh, in, in, in themselves. So these functions are, uh, for example, a DPP. Uh, there has been a lot of work on determinant point processes. These are very natural models for diversity functions. So diversity functions, uh, because they don't look at the entire, uh, entire ground set, they can often pick uh, items which are different, and they often pick outliers. Yes? So does it mean that representation functions help to maximize coverage for diversity functions may not? That's true. That, that's correct. So uh, we also will be defining coverage functions where you can explicitly call out coverage in terms of certain concepts. You can think of representation functions as maximizing coverage in terms of the, um, in terms of the space of kind of points, right? Whereas uh, uh, the, the functions which I'll be defining next, which actually I'll, I'll come to, uh, uh, the coverage functions, basically, uh, we can explicitly define a set of concepts we want to cover. So in, in, in that sense, the representation functions are somewhat different from these coverage functions. But, but you're right, coverage functions, uh, representation functions can be thought of as getting a coverage of the set of points that, are, that, are, that, that you want to uh, select from. Yes? Uh, so for, for this application, so uh, I mean, the way you uh, you formulate it uh, is if I have like a random set of frames from like from different concepts or from different parts of the video, so I have the I have the maximum information gain, and so that uh, that becomes my summary. But for a summary, usually we need a like span of span of video, video uh, basically concatenation of. Uh, multiple intervals, not, mm -hmm. not just, just frames. But yes, that's you, right. Does any of these functions encourage, uh, encourage smoothness or, or these types of things? Uh, yes, so that is, that, that's a good point. Uh, when we'll actually be covering the, the, vi the video summarization part, I will briefly gloss over that. I don't explicitly cover that, but there are certain functions that can encourage smoothness as well. So you can basically define kind of, um, spatial clusterings, right? And you can, you can basically encourage that if you're choosing, uh, choosing points, 
you want to prefer points which are may, maybe maybe spatially closer uh, uh, than the others. But uh, but 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 I think that the most important thing is that uh, something that I'll try to highlight in this talk is that that really probably depends on the domain that you care about. In certain domains, you may not really want to have all the points. So you may not necessarily want to have you know, a long sequence of points that are close to each other just spatially. Right? So, so I guess the answer to your question is that we can model this, right? but it may not necessarily be something that may be uh, highly ranked from the learning. That's why you actually want to learn from the, the mixture to understand uh, you know, how you kind of want to rank this. But uh, the, the other thing which I'll also mention is that we do handle this kind of spatiality by looking at, uh, by defining the, the, the items here which we want to summarize as not being the individual frames always, but being a set of snippets. So this is what is often used in the video summarization work where you define snippets. Snippets can, for example, be one shot. So you have one, one fixed camera angle uh, being, being a shot, and you can take these shots to be the snippets. OK, so uh, the, the coverage functions, as I kind of uh, alluded to, basically we can explicitly define a set of characteristics which we want to cover. So uh, very concretely, imagine you have a set of images and you have a set of concepts where the concepts uh, are obtained through, say, three, say a, classif a set of classifiers. Right? So you have all, all of these concepts, and then you have, for each image, you, you have the corresponding set of concepts that are covered uh, by this image. Right? So the set cover uh, function, which, which is defined over here, uh, essentially tries to uh, get a set of points that cover as many concepts as possible. And um, there is an extension to this set cover, which is called the probabilistic set cover. And the probabilistic set cover uh, basically um, extends this by allowing a probability of covering the concept. So often, you don't want to just assign a set of uh, top categories for an uh, for, for image, but you want to actually have a probability vector over all your uh, ca categories. And uh, you want to use this probability vector as a soft version for this. So that is what essentially this function uh, tr tries to model. And when, when these PIs become uh, 0, 1, then this kind of comes back to the set cover. OK, so uh, another class of coverage functions are the feature-based functions. Um, so the feature-based functions basically uh, are uh, where we take a feature. The feature could, for example, be you know, a particular layer of a convolutional uh, network. and you kind of want to have, um, uh, in, in some sense, a coverage in, in, in this feature space. So imagine that uh, you know, these, each of these, uh, these, these dimensions in the feature vector are, are a set of concepts. Then through this concave over modular set of modular functions, we basically want uniformity over all of these concepts that are covered. So th this is also very similar to the coverage functions. Uh, defined earlier, but a slightly different uh, different model. Okay, so finally, uh, these are importance functions. So importance functions are where you want to assign a score for each of your uh, images, and uh, basically these can be through some kind of a model, or it can be even features that you extract from these models, and then you kind of have these 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 fe these important scores. And the whole idea is that we want to be able to kind of um, combine all of these together. They, so basically, all of these different models together in, in our learning framework. OK, so uh, having kind of given an intuition now about these, these models, we will actually talk, about, uh, uh, talk a little bit about the algorithm uh, aspects. So uh, a natural way you can model uh, this actually there are two ways i'll highlight one way and briefly mention the other one so we can define a, a, a summarization problem as a combinatorial optimization problem where you try to maximize uh, the, the 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 information so you have f as a submodular function you try to maximize f of s uh, such that uh, the the cost of s is less than a given budget so the cost can be for example uh, just the size 
or in, in the case where, uh, for example, um, your, your, your elements are not necessarily of, of the same size. So for example, if you have shots as each of your snippets, each shot can be of a different size. So then you often want a, a budget constraint on the total length of the video, but each of your Cs are not the same. So then this is called a knapsack constrained uh, submodule optimization. So it turns out that you can have a very simple greedy algorithm. And the idea of the greedy algorithm is that at every element you pick, at, at every step, you, you start with the empty set and you grow uh, your subsets in a greedy manner. And at every step, you kind of add an element that has the maximal gain of, of adding it to the subset S divided by uh, the cost of that element. So basically, it's, you, you have both of these factors and uh, you, you continue this till you uh, uh, satisfy or, or, or till you just satisfy your, bu your budget. So basically you, uh, yeah, so this, this simple algorithmic framework, it turns out has constant factor approximation guarantees. There are different guarantees depending on different flavors of the algorithm, but at, at a very high level, you have a one minus one over E kind of approximation guarantee. And, um, I like to point out that there is a dual version of this problem. The dual version of this problem is where you want to minimize the, um, the cost such that your f of s, such that your, your uh, information is greater than a certain coverage. So this is, this is useful if you have a coverage function and you want to find the minimum set of frames or a minimum set of snippets that cover all the concepts in the video that you care about. So this is, this is kind of a dual version of this problem where you have interesting kind of theoretical properties of these. So a few comments about um, the, the kind of implementation aspects about these. So you can actually uh, 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 have a simple lazy greedy version of this problem. Uh, essentially the idea is you maintain uh, priority queues and the priority cube queues maintain upper bounds of the marginal gain. So you don't need to compute the marginal gains every time, but you just compute them if, uh, you, if, if, if there is a certain violation. So, so basically, the, uh, the idea here is that you, so if you see this, this, this algorithm, this is naively order n square, right? Because you have uh, basically, um, you have possibly order n number of steps, and in each step, you need to you, you need to search for the best uh, best item that kind of uh, uh, maximizes this gain. So you need to do another order and sweep. So if if kind of f is the cost of a function evaluation, this is order n square times f. So through the lazy greedy algorithm, uh, in 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 the worst case, it is still n square, but in practice, often this this makes it linear. Um, but there is actually a sequence of, uh, of, of improvements that are possible through memoization. And the idea here is that this is not kind of changing the worst case complexity of the algorithms per se, but this is, this is improving the complexity of the function evaluations by having, this, by having the concept of memoization. So in, in, in some sense, you can think of it as a, a simple dynamic programming kind of trick because you are uh, greedily adding elements to these subsets, you can maintain pre-computed statistics for, for these subsets. And uh, using these pre-computed statistics, you can actually evaluate the gains much more efficiently. So the idea is that instead of having the worst case uh, evaluating f of s plus v minus f of s, uh, you can actually evaluate this using a certain computed statistic which, which you maintain in memory. So, this slightly increases the cost of the memory because you need to store a certain vector through the algorithm, but you can improve the co complexity and, yeah. But this is going to be dependent on your function f, right? Yes. Because some functions cannot be cached. That's right, that's right. So this will depend on the functions, but it turns out that actually a lot of the functions which I had in my next slide, so a lot of the functions we actually use in practice, you can actually cache kind of the, the, the internal, uh, Operation. So, for example, I'll give I'll, I'll give an idea. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll give. So, if, if you use the facility location function, you have this sum over the max values, right? So, you kind of cache the max um, 
of uh, the the value for every element in your ground set. You, so you have an order n vector that you store, and using this, you can actually kind of efficiently do this. So you're you're absolutely right. You you can uh, this is this is applicable uh, only for a subset, but it turns out that most of the subsets that we use in practice uh, would be uh, would be efficiently doable through this. There are of course certain ones where even after doing this, it doesn't actually change the complexity much. So okay. So I think at this point, I I will transition to a few of the intuitions of uh, the different summarization models in, in video summarization. And I think the same intuition kind of uh, holds for the, 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 the image summarization as well. So the idea here of video summarization, so uh, I'll, I'll br briefly talk in, in the next few slides about what are the different possible models that we can do with video summarization, right? And this will be a good uh, kind of um, uh, next step to then go towards the learning because we know what are the different different kind of problems we can model through this. So the first one is extractive summarization. So in extractive summarization, we can have two flavors of the problem, right? We, we can do a fixed length snippet. So we don't care here about short, short boundaries. You just use a fixed length. Of course, the, the issue here is that you can have often transition scenes in between uh, of your snippets and those would not give very good kind of elements for your summary. So you can actually then uh, also do short-based snippets. So the, sh the, the short-based snippets would often uh, yield kind of um, multiple, uh, so it would lead to different length uh, snippets for each of your elements in your ground set. And uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier, this would, this would imply a knapsack constrained uh, submodular maximization. So this framework can also be extended towards a query-based summarization framework. So for a query-based summarization framework, you can basically um, generate a ground set, uh, which is basically related to the query. So you have a certain query, and you only want to get a set of snippets that are related to the query, and you can run extractive summarization on this kind of restricted ground set. And a third use case of this is actually concept-based summarization. So the idea of concept-based summarization is where we actually generate a, a summary of a set of concepts. So we have entities extracted, for example, faces, and we want to run a summarization on these, on, on these kind of extracted faces. So these are the different flavors of um, video summarization. Of course, you can also uh, have kind of the image summarization problem. I won't be actually covering this in, in our talk, but we do have some work that does a very similar approach towards uh, image summarization as well. So, all right, so now the, the, uh, the question is how do we actually instantiate the different functions for these, for these different uh, problems, right? So uh, the, the basic idea of our framework is that the first step is to extract features. So you can take color features, object features, scene features, et cetera. Um, using these features, you can instantiate the submodular functions, right? So as I had mentioned, you have similarity-based functions, you have coverage-based functions, you have feature-based functions. Um, and once you instantiate these, you then run the summarization algorithm. Uh, whether it's budgeted summarization, coverage summarization, et cetera. So this is the rough idea of how you would use these for, for any problem. Of course, the, the real um, kind of question now is how do we instantiate these for different applications, right? So before getting to uh, the, the rest of the talk, I'll give a very brief, this is just a video highlight about some of the results we, we, we have through using different submodular functions. This is a soccer, this is a soccer video, and uh, it seems to be a little bit jerky, I think, because of the because of the the, the video uh, because of the Google meets. So um, this is a surveillance video where again you would expect to get the different uh, different entity uh, the, the, the different kind of important portions of the video. This is entity summarization where you again have a uh, this is from friends, and you ha have a summary in the form of the different faces. And this is um, this is for for 
um, for objects. So again, we see the different objects being summarized here. And finally, this is query summarization that essentially, uh, this is the original video. And say you search for an ocean, you have all the set of snippets that are related to the ocean. And you basically want to get the different uh, ocean scenes, and you want to get a summary of these ocean scenes. And finally, this is this is the application that we have released open source. So uh, you can actually um, this is this is actually joint work with some folks in IIT Bombay, and uh, the student who has been working on this is a kind of co-advised by 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 me and this, uh, and so essentially, as you can see with with this with this application, you kind of jump through the different portions of the video, and you can see the seek bar here jumping through the through the different portions. So I think this is this this was just meant to be a kind of high level uh, idea of how we would be generating the video summaries, but I think uh, the 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 rest of the talk is really trying to get get at you know how do we kind of model these what different models would be used for different applications and how do we do the learning. So I'll quickly uh, kind of get to now some of the insights from this. So uh, the, the first one is to just get an insight of the different kind of models for, um, for extractive summarization, right? So, so take a TV show. So you have a TV show, for example, Friends, and this is an example. Here I'm just showing a set of frames. You can easily kind of extend this to a set of snippets as well. So uh, you can imagine if you have a diversity function, this would pick a set of frames that are often outliers, right? And we actually see this, that uh, a disparity min, which is one instance of a diversity function, uh, picks out the, the set of outlier frames. Uh, on the other hand, with a representation function, we would expect this to pick out the representative elements and actually skip the outliers, because you would have very few of these transition frames in, in, in the video. And we actually see that these representation functions for the most part, actually skip uh, skip the outliers. Uh, on the other hand, from a surveillance scenario, uh, this is a very specialized case where we had a very, very long video, and we are just picking four uh, frames just to highlight, again, uh, the difference between uh, a, a diversity and a representation function. In, in this case, we actually see that the, the diversity function actually picks uh, the uh, the events where you have people walking in and out, right? So we actually have two different people walking in, and a diversity function picks that. Whereas a representation function, since it focuses on the set of representative uh, points, it doesn't actually get these get these outliers. I must say though that I mean, if you have a longer video and you increase the budget size, in the end, these representation functions also would get these uh, these, these outliers, but this is kind of just getting an intuition about uh, the, the modeling difference. This is, again, a, slight, a, a different video where, again, we compare disparity mean with the facility location. Um, we do see that the, the left-hand side does get a decent diversity of the different places where the person is, whereas the, the facility location tends to pick uh, the, the frames to be somewhat less diverse, uh, arguably. So uh, a similar intuition for the concept-based summarization. So you have, again, disparity min. Uh, and in this case, we actually compare the, the, the three different classes of functions. Uh, here, disparity min tends to pick the outliers. Uh, and, and many of them are actually not faces, so they are false positives. Whereas the, the, uh, the representation function actually picks a lot of the um, the representative ones and and so on. So um, again, you could actually extend this to to several other applications as well. And we, we have the extractive summarization, the query based summarization, the object summarization, and so on. And again, I'll highlight that um, through memoization, you can actually uh, improve the uh, the cost for all of these functions. So we see that the the for summarizing a two-hour video, if you were not to use these kind of dynamic programming tricks, uh, you would actually have a, a, a much larger time taken for analyzing these videos compared to uh, with, with these. So we see this for all, 
for, for different kind of uh, budget. So you have the 5%, 15%, 30% are for different budgets. Okay, so uh, now uh, we'll talk about our main learning framework. So there has been a lot of prior work on learning mixtures of submodular functions, including some work which we did for the image collection summarization early on, and then uh, there is also work for video summarization. But uh, th this, in, in this work, we try to focus on two particular aspects. One was we really wanted to understand the domain-specific aspects of video summarization. So we wanted to understand how with different domains, you have different characterizations of the summaries. And uh, more importantly, we wanted to get back to the intuition which we had started off with, how with different, uh, different uh, mixture components, you have different intuitions in uh, designing these, and we want to actually get back these from our learned mixtures. Uh, so we'll actually cover uh, both of these aspects in this talk, and we'll try to connect it back to what we have seen in the first part. Okay, so what forms a good summary, as you can, ex as you can expect, really depends from domain to domain, right? So you have a surveillance scenario. Uh, you would expect diversity to be important, but you would also expect that objects and you'd expect that uh, the tracks of the people or the, the positions of where people are in the frame are going to be important for these kind of videos. Whereas uh, in, in the case of a TV show, the camera angle is constantly changing. You may not expect necessarily that the, the position of where the person is to be important. Again, you may not expect diversity to be important. You may expect representation to be important. And in this case, you would probably expect the, 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 uh, the faces and actions to be uh, important. And uh, uh, similarly, if you were to um, have a soccer video at a high level, again, you would expect scenes and objects to be important here. But you would also, if we were to do a multimodal uh, summarization, you would also expect sound uh, to be a kind of important aspect here along, along with action. So uh, this is uh, basically the, the idea here that when, you are, when we are defining a video summarization problem, we really would want to understand what is the modeling aspects of these different domains and how do we um, kind of um, learn these for the, for, for the domains, right? So before getting to the actual uh, modeling framework, we'll kind of understand the evaluation framework, right? So how do we evaluate video summarization? So in this work, uh, we, uh, we basically focused on a few different domains, and we'll come to our data sets in a bit. Uh, and is, is essentially, the idea is that we, we really want to have an evaluation criteria that is as um, generic as possible, or, 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 or rather, uh, uh, we, we want an evaluation criteria that is as objective as possible. So often times with summarization, one of the major uh, criticisms of the work is that uh, what constitutes, uh, it, so if we were to generate a summary uh, uh, you know, from different people, what I believe is a summary of uh, image collection or a video would be probably different from what you believe uh, is a summary, right? So there is some need of having a, a kind of more objective mechanism. And this is one attempt. I don't say that this completely kind of addresses the problem, but this is one attempt to getting the, um, the objectivity of the evaluation criteria. So essentially, for each of the domains, we define a, a, a set of interesting scenes. So we rate, uh, we basically have, uh, we have the entire video, and then we rate the different scenes in the video. Uh, so these can be rated from you know really important to, uh, to to kind of not so important. Similarly, we can also rate the negative uh, scenes. So the the really bad scenes, for, for example, scenes which should not be in the summary. An example of these could be like the jerky. In, in, if you, if you often see a surveillance video, very very often there are jerky scenes, or you know there's some kind of uh, noise in the surveillance footage. Or in the case of a TV show, this could mean the transition scenes, right? You often don't want these in the summary. So these are the negative ratings. And the third is redundancy. So in, in videos, you can also mark explicitly a set of frames as being redundant. So here, uh, I, I note that the, the redundancy is not across frames. So I'm not saying that the, the first set of frames is redundant with the last set of frames. What I'm saying is that 
I have I mark a set of frames which within themselves are redundant. So for example, if you have a surveillance video where a person is sitting uh, in his chair for 10 minutes, that entire span would be marked redundant. So using these, we can actually define a loss function. The first criteria basically uh, kind of encourages the positive ratings. We have a penalty for the negative ratings and we have a saturation for the redundancy. So basically the saturation means that uh, if for a given um, uh, snippet marked as redundant, uh, redundant, if I have more than a beta coverage, there is no gain in adding more elements. So basically any summarization algorithm that picks a lot of those redundant frames would actually suffer in terms of the final score. So now, uh, how do we kind of uh, design the, the summarization models, right? So we have a mixture of these different components. We have uh, the submodular components, which are the diversity representation coverage, and then we have the modular uh, component here, which is the importance. And we can define uh, the summarization framework as a linear combination of these kind of different, uh, different components. Of course, you could do slightly more uh, kind of involved tricks by having, by learning weights. So often you can define weights within each of these functions as well. In, in this work, we don't, consider, uh, we don't consider that framework. We just consider a framework here where we use each of our models as features and we have a linear uh, kind of combination of these features. What these features are, I will come to it in the next slide. And then we, we, we define the loss function. So this loss function is basically the standard max margin kind of framework. Uh, at, at this point, I'd like to mention that there are other ways uh, we can define, uh, we, we can do the learning. Many of the ways also define probabilistic models on submodular functions. Um, but we actually won't, we, we didn't look at that, uh, that explicitly in, in, in this work. Um, and I, I won't be covering that in this talk, but it's, 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 it's interesting to note also that there are different ways you can uh, kind of learn these and there are, often very, there are often subtleties involved in each one of them. So there are assumptions made here. For example, uh, the assumption made here is that, this, that there is a discrete optimization uh, uh, problem that needs to be solved at every iteration, which is here the LN. And in order to compute the gradients, you need to solve this discrete optimization problem. So the assumption is that we can efficiently solve these, this discrete optimization problem. Uh, in the case of probabilistic models, you don't explicitly need it that you need to solve this discrete optimization problem, but you need to be able to compute the uh, partition function efficiently. So, so basically, in some sense, for different models, you can use different ones of these depending on which one is easier. Okay, so now what are the mixture components, right? So uh, we basically uh, have a set of features. The features are the scene features, object features, color features, but we also use the object detections themselves. So uh, uh, as I had mentioned, we are interested in not just the, uh, the presence or absence of objects in the frame, but also where objects are uh, present in the frame for certain domains, right? So we can define features based on these based on the object detections, and we can do the same for the faces as well. So we have features uh, basically uh, defined through each of these different components. And for, for each of these features, for example, uh, the scene features, we can use the final scene category, but we can also use the intermediate features uh, derived from, uh, say, a CNN, uh, which can be used for computing a similarity uh, measure. So if you want to compare uh, two images, and you want to compare a similarity measure between two images of how similar they are, we can use the scene features. Um, and from the modeling perspective, we use uh, the different kind of models. So we have the representation models, the diversity models, the importance models, and the coverage models, and all the functions I had mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we actually use the entire set of these uh, functions. So uh, we have a domain-specific data set. So we, have, we, we collected five different domains uh, from sports, from personal videos, and from surveillance categories. So we, we restricted to these three kind of videos. And uh, we actually kind of uh, split the 
So, so basically these videos, one part we want to highlight is that these videos are actually very or often long videos. So several existing data sets for video summarization, first of all, are not really domain specific. So they would not allow us to really understand this interplay between different domains. But uh, also moreover, uh, these videos are actually longer videos than often what are considered in several of these other data sets. So, uh, we do standard uh, splitting of the data sets, and uh, we, we, we actually uh, use, use Adagrad for tuning, and one important point is that we actually tune the hyperparameter on the validation uh, data set. And uh, uh, so in some sense, the, the different hyperparameters do play an important role over here. I, I briefly just mentioned this in, the, in, in this talk. Uh, so if you recall in this formulation, we have two different lambdas here. The first lambda is for uh, the, the, the submodular functions, and the second lambda is for the importance function. And the reason is because in this particular work, we just use the features uh, derived from these different models as the importance function. So in some sense, we want to learn uh, both the uh, submodular models along with the modular importance scores in, in this combined formulation. So it, it, it's, it's kind of important here to tune uh, the regularization, and we did try several different ways, including um, um, basically different, different optimization algorithms and different kind of learn, learning rates, as well as the different lambdas. Uh, uh, and um, the, the best parameters would obviously kind of depend from domain to domain, and there is some intuition towards this. We'll actually get towards that in, in the end of the talk. So uh, a quick sanity check. So the ground truth scores, as you would expect, are actually uh, better than the, the random score. So we take random summaries, and we evaluate them, and we take the ground truth summaries. This is just a sanity check that indeed the evaluation criteria and the ground truth is good. In, in, in the paper, we also have more details about uh, the kind of, uh, since we collect this evaluation, so since we collect the ground truth ratings from several uh, humans, we actually look at correlation between them and make sure that the data we obtain is makes sense. Yeah. This is a very naive question. Can you go back to the slide with the loss function? Yes. So. My question is that, so with submodular functions, you know, you have this function f, yes, right, and you you said that you can choose a function which is a representation function or a diversity function or so on, yes, and you can define this function in terms of some features from a CNN, yes. right? So in diversity, you can say something like how diverse are my CNN fe the features of the images that I've chosen, yes, and you said that you can have like greedy approximations with some guarantees. Mm -hmm where you can start like choosing frames from an image collection with yes. big image summarization. Yes. So in this formulation, there is no learning involved. There's no learning, yes. So where does this loss function come in? Okay, what, so what, that's why a great question. This and how does it fit into that frame? That's a great, that, that's a great question. Okay, so uh, the, so may, maybe I should have highlighted this uh, better and this is a great, it's great that you asked this question. So. Uh, the model that we are considering here is essentially where we take, so you, you can imagine, uh, okay, so uh, when we come to these mixture components, right, you have each of these features, and from each of these features, you have one instantiation of a submodular function. So you can imagine that you have, you know, possibly hundreds of different instantiations by doing this cross product. So you have different features, there are scene features, object features, color features. For each one of these, you can define a similarity measure, and you can define a corresponding representation function, you can define a corresponding diversity function, and so on. What you really want to do is you want to combine all of these, right? And you want to learn these for different domains. And the, 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 the main intuition, as I had uh, mentioned in the beginning, was we wanted to understand how these, how the learnt mixtures look for different domains, right? So you would expect in a surveillance domain, you want the diversity functions to be, to have a higher weight, right? Because you would expect that those are probably more important for those domains. So in some sense, in, in our learning framework, we are treating these different models as features. And we are learning the, the weight of, of these models. So is your final function f that you derive, 
or that okay. you optimize. Yes. A combination yes. of handwritten functions, like there'll be a function for representation. Of That's right. Drivers, and you're That's learning right. some combination of these. That's right. Are combinations of submodular functions also submodular? Yes, they are. Because that is required. That is required. They are. So as long as the weights learned are non-negative, so in this in this learning uh, framework, I we I I don't um, yeah. So the so if you see here, there is this weight being non-negative, right? So so yeah, we 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 need to constrain the weights to be non-negative, and if the weights are non-negative, then the weighted combinations of these are is sub is still submodular. I see. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. So. Um, any other questions? OK, so uh, the results, I think in the next five minutes, I'll very quickly uh, go over, or at least just give the motivation, the, the bigger picture of the results. So there are two takeaways of these results. The first is, the, on, on the left-hand side, we use different sets of submodular functions. right? So the first one, we have the all modular. In this case, we just use the importance functions. The all submodular is where we just use a diversity coverage and representation, we ignore the importance. And uh, the full is where we use, we use both of these. And then we have some other uh, baselines. Uh, and and in, the, in the paper, we have a few other baselines as well. I, I don't actually have them in, in, in the talk. One, one important thing is that the submodular that I have here is taking the best individual submodular mixture, a component, the best individual submodular component. So, these are the, this is in terms of the loss, and the loss function is what I had mentioned, which takes all the three into account from the human ratings, right? So the loss function for, from the from the loss perspective, we see that on the test set, the full uh, the full uh, learnt function that is using both modular and submodular actually is better in 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 all the domains, and uh, we obviously see that the submodular themselves are much better than just uniform or random. But the individual submodular components are often not as good as uh, the, the learned mixtures. And uh, the second takeaway is that when you learn mixtures for a given domain, like, uh, 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 like say, for example, soccer, then uh, the, uh, the performance on soccer itself is good. But if you were to evaluate the learned mixture from another domain, it is not as good. So basically, what this means, what this suggests, is that uh, when you, from this framework, when we just learn specifically on one domain, the the mixture, the the, the learnt mixture in the end is not as good as the other domains. Um, and uh, we wanted to study this a little better uh, to try to understand what the what are the components that we are learning. So the left-hand side column here is the top components, of both modular and submodular, of the. So we, we have the left-hand side. Uh, so there, there are two uh, things for each of the function, right? We have the function, the, the model itself, and the features. So we see that uh, uh, the, the the main the, the main insight from this is that we we take the left-hand side, um, the, the left-hand side column, and these are the top mixture the top weights which we learn and the right hand side uh, column are the top individual components if you were to score them individually so basically i take a function from this i have this feature i have this model cross feature i form an individual mixture and then i uh, I, I i take the score and i take the top scores based on that and i take the top scores based on the learnt mixture and we see that there is a there is a there's quite a good correlation between the two, which suggests that the mixtures that are being learned from our framework actually are individually also the best components on this on, on these data sets for, for, for the most of the cases. And the second uh, intuition here is that uh, we really wanted to understand what these components are. So we take an office scenario and we take the top 10 components learned amongst, uh, I, I guess, around 200 odd different components. And we see that um, the disparity, uh, the, so we have the DM here, which is a diversity model, it's, it's, it's disparity min. Uh, those actually are the best models 
for the for this the surveillance video, which actually makes which, which is what we would expect. Uh, so we see five of these models are are come in the top ten. Uh, on the other hand, we see when we see birthday and cricket, we don't see any of the diversity models. We see more of the coverage models, and we see more of the uh, the, the the MOD here or the modular ones are the importance models. Uh, it's also interesting if you, you were to take a look at the features. So we see that. Uh, the object features and the object detector features and the color features are important in the case of surveillance. You will see none of the scene features are coming up. So you would not expect a scene feature to be important in surveillance, in, in, to, be importance in a, to, to be important in the surveillance domain. Whereas if we take a look at these other domains, for example, cricket, which is a sport, we see a lot of the scene features uh, being important. So these were kind of um, uh, uh, kind of interpretations which we thought made sense from our kind of domain knowledge from the video summarization aspect. And we also looked at the top frames from these different domains, and we see that the top frames also make sense. In the case of birthday, for example, we have the birthday girl, and we have people taking selfie. These were the highest rated frames. In the case of the entry exit, which is a surveillance scenario, we have the case where the person is walking in as the, the, the most important frames. So uh, I, I guess I'm almost done. So the conclusions, uh, uh, basically, and next steps, we wanted to understand the domain-specific aspect of summarization. So we, we kind of went over, in the beginning, the submodular models for summarization. We tried to understand some intuition of how in different domains, different models uh, kind of perform. And then we defined a learning framework, and we tried to get some insights from the su sum summarization models on the different domains. And uh, obviously, several feature work, future work for us, uh, so some interesting future work, is to extend this to several other tasks, including multimodal uh, approaches for summarization. And uh, uh, we also would like to kind of um, understand the domain specific aspect of how we can maybe transfer uh, knowledge from, from different domains. Because as you can imagine, it's not always easy to generate ratings and domain specific training data. So really the question is, how do we transfer this kind of intuition? We, we, we can expect that certain characteristics may not be easy to tra transfer, but there'll be certain characteristics which will be easy. And it's really kind of an interesting problem to understand how this, um, how this extends. And uh, very quickly, I'll point out some other representative projects which we have uh, done. Um, we, we had a very similar work from an image summarization perspective. The difference there was that we, 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 we were in a model here with, without ratings, but really with humans giving a subset of images as summaries, which is the more standard model for summarization. And we were one of the first works to actually introduce the learning framework for some modular functions in uh, this kind of visual summarization problem. Um, we also did some work on data subset selection and active learning, um, basically where you want to kind of create a subset of data for labeling. You have really huge amounts of data. And uh, it, it's a cost for people to label this. So how do we have a joint diversity and active learning framework? We had some work on, again, on learning related to some probabilistic models on submodular functions. And uh, we did some work on, around optimization of submodular functions and a unified gradient-based framework for optimization and some other work then around metrics, submodular partitioning, and some more recent work at Microsoft, which was more around um, kind of online learning and contextual bandits framework for, um, for kind of the ads work uh, as well. So, uh, that's it. I mean, if you have any questions, uh, I guess we are almost out of time. So if you have any questions, we can probably discuss in person as well. Thank you.